Hi. Um, welcome to the uh, Adam Smith Institute webinar on the power of innovation. Um, I'm uh, Madison Peary, president of the Adam Smith Institute, and my guest is Dr. Anton Howes, who is uh, head of innovation research at the Entrepreneurs Network, uh, promoting uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, he was a lecturer in economic history at King's College London and is the author of uh, Arts and Minds, which is a history of the Royal Society for Art. Uh, let me introduce the subject first. Um, <clears throat> many people <clears throat> wonder how to boost the uh, United Kingdom recovery following the pandemic. There'll be a need for new businesses and more innovations. Some businesses will go to the wall. Um, <clears throat> And uh, we want others to step into the space vacated and uh, redeploy capital and resources into new ventures. The question is, how do we do this? Anton, you've compiled a dossier of about 1500 uh, inventors, the ones you've studied in the period leading up to and including the Industrial Revolution. Let's start by asking you if there's a pattern. Have you spotted anything that they have in common? Hi, Madison. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be back, by the way. Uh, yes, there are a few patterns um, that I should point out. So the first of these is that of the inventors that I've studied from the Industrial Revolution, these are people who are improving. I can see a question popping up saying, what kind of, what are we, how are we defining innovation? The people who are making improvements to goods, to services, um, who are reforming postal services, improving the efficiency of anything or everything, or even improving how how good a product looks or how good a product tastes and so on. Of the people who I was looking at, the vast majority of them seem to have had some prior exposure to other inventors before becoming inventors themselves. That's one of the main, main findings. So of the almost 1500 people in my database, about 83% of them, I could find some prior exposure to another inventor before they became an inventor themselves. Now, the interesting thing about that, and there's a few other little bits to point out here, is that of the inventors who have been inspired in this way, they are not necessarily inspired by someone who was inventing in the same area. Invention doesn't seem to just be some kind of skill that gets passed down. So it's not just steam engineers are coming into contact with other people who are then inspired to improve steam engines. Yeah, you're, saying it's not you're saying it's not compartmentalized. It's not compartmentalized, right? Invention seems to be something that we can apply to anything and to everything. So we get examples, for example, of potters inspiring steam engineers and those steam engineers inspiring civil engineers and those civil engineers inspiring people who then go on to improve gardening or agriculture or whatever other kind of field you might look at. And so there are a few other things to note here. One of them is that the majority of the inventors I looked at were polymathic in some way. They were improving multiple industries. And even within those industries, they're often improving them in very different ways. Um, so it's not just that people have a particular invention or a particular skill set that they have, and then they just apply that to, a, to the thing that they already know and make those things better because they have that skill. Invention is often something where they can apply themselves beyond the realm of what they already know, which brings me to another thing I noticed, which is that a very significant minority of them, at least a third, if not more of them, were improving areas where they had no prior training whatsoever. So we're talking lawyers, deciding to go into mechanical engineering. People like William George Armstrong, you may have heard of the Armstrong gun, um, the sort of thing that's being produced in the lead up to World War I. He was just a lawyer right up until his 30s, although he had this, this passion, this hobby um, for mechanical engineering. Likewise, people like Edmund Cartwright, uh, one of the really famous names of the Industrial Revolution for improving textile machinery. He was a clergyman, had never had any involvement really with the textile industry as a weaver, as a spinner or anything like that. But he has this idea of improving it in a particular way as an outsider and then having this perspective going in that he's able to um, apply there. So a significant minority of them seem not to have had a skill, which also again suggests that innovation isn't a particular skill. It's not something that you train necessarily. And the thing I think that it is, having observed the way that inventors throughout the period, and even today, talk about invention, talk about the process of it, is that it's a mentality, is that it's a mindset. Um, and the key way to define it, I think, is that 
the improving mentality, if you will, is that people see that things are a problem. They see room for improvement where other people don't see room for improvement, right? That they see that something could be better rather than just making do and saying, okay, well, that's life. I'm just going to continue um, the way I've always done things. Or, you know, a bad thing happens to me. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, you know, take it on the chin and move on. Inventors tend, the first step of invention seems to be that people see that something could be better. They identify that it is a problem. And then they go and do something about it, right? So whining about something and complaining that there are problems is not enough to make you an inventor. The next step there is actually thinking, okay, I can actually do something about this. I can make an improvement. I can make some kind of incremental change or even a larger change than that um, to bring about a solution to that problem. Now, um, you've compared the process of invention, uh, have you not, um, to a funnel. Um, there are large numbers of potential uh, innovators at the open end of the funnel, but only a few uh, make it to, to the narrow end and come through to um, introduce and only a few of them end up at that end. What happened to them during that? What, why, why are the numbers so diminished? Right, so this is, I think, a key way that I think about how, when we think about innovation policy, how we can promote invention, how we can make it accelerate even further than it has already, that a lot of the time when we look at policies, we think of the very narrow end of the funnel. We think of people who are already entrepreneurs, already inventors, already perhaps have some idea and are trying to make um, something of it. But really at the, the wide end of the funnel, you've got the population at large, and then only a few of those people come into contact with inventors of some sort. You might have an uncle who's an inventor, you might do an, have a teacher who's an inventor, you might have an apprentice, you might be apprenticed inventor and so on and so forth. Um, then of the people who have come into contact with inventors, a lot of people are not gonna be particularly interested in them. You know, they may have, they may have an uncle who is an inventor, but they might not find them particularly engaging or interesting. They might be quite bored by them. They might be uninspired or uninterested. So then we've got an even narrower group of people who are those inspired to improve things by their contact with inventors. And then we can narrow it down further in that, you know, some people are dissuaded from it. It might be that they have a family who wants them to go into the law, into medicine, to go into something where they maybe don't have as much chance or banking or something. Medicine actually probably does give you quite a bit of chance to make improvements, but law and, and, and banking might not be quite so much. Um, or it might be that they have a lack of time or lack of money. They might get distracted. And so the number of people who are come into contact, have been inspired, and then actually go about doing some invention, that's even narrower. And then we narrow it still further in that a lot of people have great ideas and it never gets past the drawing board or never gets even onto the drawing board. It never even gets beyond their head. They've conceived of something that might be useful and then they never actually make something of it. Um, and there are those people who duplicate efforts. They simply reinvent something that's been invented elsewhere. Um, or they try to solve problems that aren't really problems, or those people who simply have bad luck. And so once you narrow things down, or the people who lack particular skills or can't get support or can't get mentorship or can't get funding, and once you've got from those people who are actually trying to do inventions, you then end up with the people who are actually driving forward progress, the people who are creating economic growth, but even beyond what's covered by GDP statistics, you know, improving quality of life in any and every way imaginable, you know, coming up with better products, coming up with new ways of doing things, coming up with ways to make our lives, um, even if it's just individuals or small groups, let alone the nations or the world as a whole, making things better for people. Yeah, um, could I remind people, by the way, you, you, if you're watching now, you can send in, in questions uh, live while, while we're talking. Um, but um, you, you mentioned that was 83% you said had previous, previously met other inventors, not necessarily in their field. Um, what was it about the society at the time that enabled them to do that? I mean, how many people today would casually come across an inventor? You know, I suppose the answer, my guess, would that be quite small. But then it, it, it appeared to you, you had a much larger chance. Was that because knowledge was, was less specialized than it is now? Was society more fluid? I, oh, how, why do you suppose it was that yeah, people I mean, could meet other inventors? I would actually say today there are probably there's more chance of coming into contact with an inventor than oh, social, media, social media. Yes, 
due to not just social media, but you know, you might come across invention in in on film, on TV, um, let alone meet someone face to face. Uh, and there's the fact that there are more inventors alive today than probably in absolute numbers than at any other period in human history, um, simply as a function of the fact that we have a greater population than ever before. But also, I think within that population, the proportion of people who seem to be engaged in research and development of some kind or invention in a way that maybe doesn't come under, you know, anything mechanical or so on, but it constantly improving things. Um, I think a lot of those people, it's, we have a pretty high chance of coming into contact with people. Now, the interesting question, I guess, is, you know, why is it that in the past, inventors never quite got to a critical mass until the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries? Why in particular in Britain does that take off? Um, part of the reason I think, I mean, one of the interesting things when you look back at the, the data that I've collected of inventors from the very early period is they're overwhelmingly concentrated in a particular city in the 16th century and in the 17th century, and that's London. Um, London, more than any other place um, in Europe, perhaps, and perhaps even in the world in the 16th, 17th century, seems to start developing this concentration of people. And that seems to be about drawing more and more people into its network, um, drawing more and more commerce, more and more inventors, more and more of the kind of the population just in general around that, giving people a higher chance of coming into contact with people. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's anything especially unusual about the period, however, in terms of the ability to come into contact. I think what happens next is, is the kind of important aspect. Why is it that a lot of people who come into contact with inventors then don't go on to invent themselves? Yes. Um, Andrew Chalk asks, um, does the prevalence of two income households today um, increase the amount of invention? does it create more possibilities for invention? Interesting. That is a really interesting question. Um, I suspect there might be something to that. I don't know of any evidence that's necessarily pointed towards it. Perhaps there have been some studies of that. If you've, um, got one, if you've got one partner winning the bread, so to speak, it might leave the other one free to, to speculate, innovate and invent. Yeah, it could go. It could go either way. I mean, there's a reason a lot of clergymen seem to have been doing quite a bit of amateur invention in the 18th century because they seem a lot of them had actually a lot of spare time to do things rather than yeah. having to go out and earn an income. Having said that, at the same time, perhaps having people out in the workforce all the time and constantly coming into contact with other people in various professions maybe increases the likelihood of exposure to invention. So, I'd have. I think that's a really really interesting question, but I don't. I couldn't do more than speculate. I don't think. You mentioned, you know, when we're talking about, you know, coming further down this funnel and, and you know, you mentioned this, the kind of things that might reduce people's propensity to get to the end of it and come out with a real successful invention. Uh, you, you mentioned, you know, that they might not get encouragement from their uh, friends, family and so on. Are, are, are there any other factors that inhibit them, that, that contribute to, to narrowing down the numbers? Um, yes, I mean, there's, there's an absolutely huge number of barriers, or perhaps just lack of things that can happen. Um, it's difficult not to get into generalizations about it, you know, discouragement's one, I think simple distraction is another. Um, lack of resources can take all sorts of different forms, it can be time, it can be money, it can be attention, even. Um, let alone things like a lack of skills can be off-putting. Although I've mentioned that a lot of inventors would invent things without necessarily having a formal training, they often got around that by self-educating, um, by often being in, coming into contact with people that, or, or calling upon people that they could use as experts, essentially, to help them with particular problems. You know, so Edmund Cartwright's a clergyman, he's improving weaving, but he still goes to a mechanics shop to try and get them. He says, you know, here's the design that I have in mind. Can you go about doing this? In the same way that today, I'm sure lots of people have ideas for a new app and they'll go and find a software engineer to maybe help them make that, that idea a reality. They don't necessarily have to have that skill themselves. Um, so access to skills um, or access to the ability to self-educate can be another really huge one. And I think today we've had a real revolution, perhaps, in the number of people that can get past that stage in the funnel, um, simply because it's so much easier than ever to, ed to educate, to self-educate. Yeah, um, we've had a, a question also from Andrew Chalk, by the way, um, about yesterday's Bloomberg survey ranking countries in terms of their... Um, that, where they come on the table of, of innovation. And uh, uh, my colleague Eamon 
point out that Korea comes top, you know, in Singapore second. Um, we, we are um, way down at number 18. Now, once you said we were top dog, London was the top city in the world and Britain was the top country. And now we're only number 18. Um, is this to be regretted? Yes, I think it is to be regretted. I think it is a good, it is a good idea for every country to want to be as innovative as possible and to be to be top dog. Now, in a, in a way, it's a good thing that other countries have managed to find ways to surpass Britain. I mean, this really starts much earlier. It's, it's certainly by 1900 already, America has overtaken Britain in terms of GDP per capita. So one of our main broad ways of measuring how, how successful an economy is at, at, at growing. Um, again, a kind of proxy measure, if you like, for accelerating innovation underneath that, because so much of that growth comes from increasing productivity, comes from innovations. Um, but even apart from that, it, there's something to be said for international competition, um, for driving forward the development of institutions, the development of um, a culture, if you like, or different uh, organizations within civil society to support innovation. Um, in fact, one of the things I would say about Britain in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries is that they're remarkably paranoid. Um, nearly all the time, inventors are able to point to other countries and say, in this specific way, this other country is doing things better. In this other specific way, another country is doing things better. In the 16th century, they're pointing to the Casa de Contratación in Spain, um, in Seville, which is the kind of almost an, the, one of the earliest major research and development centers for the entire Spanish empire. If you went on a voyage to the New World, you had to check in with the Casa, the House of Trade, to translate it. Uh, to give all information about new discoveries, all information about new instruments, all information about um, new techniques you may have uncovered, and they would collect and collate things there. And this is the sort of thing that the English are trying to replicate for about a century later. They never quite do it, but they find other ways in which to, to work around it. But again, in the 18th century, it's about there are lots of institutions they form to try and replicate what they see done abroad, sometimes worse, sometimes better. Um, in the 19th century, they're looking at things like exhibitions, industrial exhibitions, they're, look, they're getting worried about the French catching up. Again, that, I think the international competition element there can be particularly valuable. Um, and so it's worth regretting it because then I think people do something about it and then everyone wins overall from, from everyone trying to win on the innovation race. Yeah, um, when Britain was top dog, um, what did we have that other countries didn't have? You know, um, why, why did the Industrial Revolution uh, start up in Britain rather than elsewhere? So the way I'd like to characterize it is, and this is something I, this is an analogy I was using well before coronavirus, is that in a way the exposure to invention became uh, much more prevalent. So inventors in Britain, and I, I mean inventors in Britain in particular, not necessarily policymakers, but inventors in Britain found ways to make the improving mentality more viral. They raise the R number, I guess, is one way that today people have a lot of um, um, experience with. So, and that comes in a number of forms. So if you think about the funnel, there are lots of institutions that they're developing that will get more support for inventors. They're, they're coming up with new ways of getting funding for themselves. A lot of it, I think, is driven by that kind of paranoia about, about a nation falling behind. And so in that way, they're able to persuade policymakers to put in place the kinds of institutions that will support them. A great example of this would be patents. The British basically, or the English at the time, they, they copy the patent system from Venice. There are loads of similarities between the early patent system um, down to things like the duration, typically 10 years, later becomes a 7 or 14, 21 year thing because of the duration of English apprenticeships. But it's something that initially is done on the Venetian model um, and then eventually um, is adopted to suit um, English circumstances. Um, likewise, things like the development, the development of the joint stock company comes out of a merging of various Italian German ways of doing things and then applying it um, to the English model. Um, again, using mo uh, monopoly patents as well in a similar way. Um, an openness to inventors in general, right? So almost a kind of liberal immigration policy for skilled, in uh, skilled inventors um, using patents, sometimes through monopoly patents, sometimes just a letters patent that would say, you know, either queen or king designates you a denizen or a citizen of the country and, and give you various rights and protections to come here and practice your trade and introduce a particular um, art or a particular skill 
to this country that we currently don't already have. Um, so in time after time after time, I think Britain in general was just especially good at adopting these things and, and often making them slightly better. Um, so there are lots of precursors to the Royal Society, famous for the 1660s for, for, for spreading the uh, useful knowledge in other countries, but none of them quite end up being quite as um, influential and long lasting and important as the Royal Society in London. Um, likewise, the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, which, which I recently wrote my book about, um, set up in the 1750s, there are actually a whole bunch of precursors to it in other countries, including in France. Um, but the English one is the one that really takes off and really takes root. So in a kind of general meta sense, an institutional sense, the thing that's said about England in 1700 is true in terms of how they're encouraging invention, which is that if you want something invented, look abroad, typically they'd say, look to France. If you want something improved or bettered or perfected, you go to Britain. And it's that ability to take things and then make them slightly better when they're applying them um, that I think gave Britain that slight edge there. What about the, um, the view among some historians like Deirdre McCloskey and Mockerholz that, that there's a kind of climate of improvement. It, it's um, intellectually respectable, almost indeed fashionable to, to, to seek to be an improver and, and to convey to other people that sense that we should all try to be a society of improvers. Is, is that a factor? Yeah, but I think, so the key thing that I would say there is, in, in a sense, I'm stepping back just to one step from that, which is to say, well, how does that climate come about in the first place? And I think a lot of that comes from the inventors themselves, being evangelizers for invention, coming up with ways to make invention more popular. I mean, there's a real crisis, for example, in the 17th century, where to be a projector or to be an improver becomes a dirty word, right? They become very associated with absolutism, so many people are being, being given patents by the king so that he doesn't have to call parliament. Um, a lot of the inventors, legitimate inventors, come in with very real efficiency improvements to various different, um, different processes. They get lumped in with a lot of the corrupt ones. And sometimes the ones who are coming up with real inventions are also being corrupt. They're being, they're being tools of, of, of kingly absolutism in the lead up to the English Civil War. And even during the Civil War and a bit after it, you have that kind of you have this negative perception of people coming up with fancy new projects that require people's funding, that require people's support. You know, oh, if only you give me a bit of your money, I'll come, in, I'll, I'll, I'll create this new invention that will completely revolutionise things. Right, that kind of that kind of problem that you see is the sort of thing that inventors continually have to adapt to. They continually have had to come up with new words to replace projector or to replace improvement, invention, innovation. You know, these are maybe the latest ways in which, you know, there are a lot of other older ways in which people have referred to the same sort of thing and coming up with a new way to, to, to make sure that it gains that social cachet. So in the 16th, 17th centuries, it's about getting elite approval, getting the king's approval, getting approval from the, the richest merchants and the nobility. In the, 17th, in the late 17th century or mid 17th century, um, the trend really is about trying to make sure that having got the king's approval, for invention in, in a broad sense, that we don't, we don't then lose the people's approval for invention. And then a lot of the early 18th century is about getting that approval and, and, and solidifying it until improvement becomes something that's accepted throughout society as a whole. Again, something that requires continual institutional development, continual adaptation to changing circumstances there. It's a sort of hard fought thing. Yes, um, you, you made that point about uh, if you want in, in new inventions, look abroad, if you want improvements, you come to Britain. Um, I noticed in your book, um, Arts and Minds, that you, you point out that uh, artisans mixed with intellectuals um, in creating that climate of improvement. It seems that many innovations came from people working on the shop floor, not, not from you know, great, uh, shall, shall we say, abstract thinkers, but from people who just knew how to fix things. Now, um, how was it that in Britain, the, the uh, thinkers and the tinkerers were able to come together, you know, the, the intellectuals and, and the, the guys with their hands on the wooden machinery. Um, it, did the weakening of the aristocracy play a part in, in breaking down class barriers? Uh, you know, what was it that enabled that, that mixing to take place? There's a bit of both. So I think you're right to focus on artisans, but we shouldn't do down the theorists. So very often it's actually the marriage of the two that's particularly valuable yes. there. 
So historians like uh, Margaret Jacob, they talk about the savant and the fabricant, the thinkers and the doers, the head and the hands, if you like. Now, actually, a lot of the inventors are a bit of both. Um, it's maybe a bit of a mistake to categorize them in, firmly in one camp or the other. Um, but you're right that one of the interesting things about England, I think, more so than particularly countries like France, um, the Netherlands is sort of interesting because it's a much flatter um, society, um, because it's so mercantile. And maybe Italy is a bit interesting as well in some regards. But France is a great contrast when it comes to how the extent to which those, those groups were merged. Now, I think two things are going on there. One of them is that from the 16th century, people who are improving a lot of the manual um, professions, so for example, being a shipwright, what they managed to do is they managed to elevate themselves above ordinary shipwrights. So people like Matthew Baker, who's one of the people who completely revolutionizes the design of ships in the 1570s. One of the things he manages to do is use the fact that he's a bit of mathematical understanding, um, even though he's kind of considered an ordinary artisan, and make himself someone who the aristocracy will take seriously as being in the middling class, right? So he kind of elevates himself above the manual trades. Um, he creates for himself this new position that hadn't been there before, to the extent that a lot of the upper class, we're talking dukes and earls, you know, the really top people in the nobility, the people often, you know, Elizabeth I's favourites, they will then actually go and seek instruction from those people and say, I want to learn things like navigation, you know, how to use, uh, you know, it's one of the interesting things is someone like Sir Francis Drake actually knows how to use navigation instruments. He's not just a captain that's on the ship and kind of as a military general, which is what some of the earlier ones have been like. Right? A lot of the nobility are actually learning these skills. And you see that reflected in a lot of the institutions that they're creating, um, which is that in France, for example, you get like, this movement from the 1590s for academies for the um, education of the nobility, but they concentrate on horse riding and fencing and dancing, maybe a bit of music. Maybe there's a little bit of maths because of fortifications and so on, because you need a bit of geometry for that. In England, you've got much more emphasis on all sorts of other more practical skills, on anatomy, on geometry in general, on navigation, on optics. Um, they've managed to convince the nobility in this period that actually these are valuable things for them to learn as well, and so make themselves more valuable at the same time. But it's interesting, one of the things that happens in the, 16th, uh, sorry, in the 17th century is that you get, on the one hand, a lot of people complaining about these noble projectors. On the other hand, you've also got this project by the king and by some of the upper nobility to try and reform the nobility, to make them better stewards, if you like, of, of, of the country, to make the lords you know, of higher quality to uphold the monarch. And so actually, some of, there's a very early, I've just been researching recently, um, a very early proto version of the Royal Society set up in the 1630s. It only lasts about a year because of kind of Coincidentally, there's a, a plague breaks out and a year and a half later, all of the people have been dispersed and the money's gone and a few of the professors have died. Um, but there's one that, that sets up in the 1630s, um, bind the nobility for the education of the nobility, but also has all of these Royal Society elements tacked on for the accumulation of knowledge. Um, and so a lot of it comes from the nobility, but also from the bottom at the same time. I think Britain gets this nice middle ground where it's sufficiently distributed in terms of these new projects for creating institutions or new initiatives for, for spreading innovation further, for making it more viral, that a lot yeah, of countries have, just don't have. We've had a question from Graham Sedgley. It's, it's one that interests me, which is, we all know governments have really quite a bad record of big picking winners, as they call it. Um, is, isn't it a fact that, um, that when we try to help innovators, we're helping the ones we can see? That is the ones who've already made it pretty close to the narrow end of that funnel. Mm -hmm. And there's perhaps the stuff we should be doing further back, you know, in, instead of picking one or two of those who are close to the end and helping them through it, the stuff we should be doing further back the funnel to encourage other people to head down successfully towards the end. Is there a case for that? Yes, I think there's a strong case for that. So. <laughs> The reason I have this funnel analogy, or I kind of think of it as upstream downstream, you've got upstream policies that are kind of the things at the top of the funnel, you've got downstream policies that are the ones at the very end of it. You're right, I think Tim, a lot of the innovation policy or a lot of the sorts of things we talk about when we think about innovators and how to improve it, very much focuses on the people, as you say, who are right at the end of it, people who are basically already inventors, they already have ideas, perhaps they're already entrepreneurs, how do we get a bit of extra funding for them, how do we tweak their tax incentives, 
Should we make patents that little bit longer, a little bit shorter? When actually we should be thinking of the stuff that's further upstream. Now, the problem is the further upstream you go, the fuzzier the language gets about how you do it. You know, how do you say, oh, let's create a culture of invention? That's so broad a thing that's very difficult to come up with very um, specific things to do about, or how do we improve skills? Or how do we generally make sure that people aren't dissuaded or have the resources, right? The problem is that we get broader and broader, but although that becomes broad and you kind of have this possibility of, of descending into kind of BS buzzwords and all sorts of other problems, and it becomes very difficult to evaluate in terms of how those policies work. Interestingly, I think some of the best interventions that you can have at the very, you know, in terms of more people coming into contact with inventors or being inspired to improve things, those things actually tend to be the cheapest things. They often also tend to be uh, the sorts of things that governments don't even necessarily need to do at all. That can you give examples? Civil society. Examples? Well, so for example, you know, I, so I, one of the things I'm working on right now for the Entrepreneurs Network is a paper uh, uh, proposing that there should be an alternative, um, a new order of chivalry parallel to that of the OBE, of the Order of the British Empire, that specifically rewards people for their innovations. Because um, at the moment, if you look at the majority of the OBE recipients, you might be an inventor and entrepreneur on them, but typically the people are winning it for their charitable stuff. They've become successful and they've and then they've won it typically for giving away their money to other causes, but mm. not for the actual invention themselves. So having an alternative one like that would be a, a very extremely cheap. For a government, we're talking like less than spare change, like the sort of thing you discover when you put your jeans through the wash and there's like a, a penny left over um, that's gone stuck in, stuck in the washing machine or something. Like this is very, very minimal amounts of money for something that could have a huge impact. Uh, again, difficult to evaluate perhaps. Um, but if you make innovation something that people, you know, growing up know that they can, will get from society as a whole, um, recognition for, I think that's an extremely valuable one. Um, or likewise, in terms of civil society doing stuff instead of governments, um, this is the sort of thing where, you know, how, how are inventors being portrayed in the media? How are inventors being portrayed in film, on television, um, in books? Um, on the radio, you know, this is this is something that's well worth thinking about. Um, I've recently been, you know, myself watching through a lot of the, I, I asked a lot of people on Twitter for recommendations for things about invention on, on film and TV. Um, and having gone through quite a few of them now, it's striking how bad a lot of them are. Um, not in terms of being bad movies per se, but bad in terms of not actually spreading and improving mentality. They're not actually showing much about the invention or the process. Um, or they're depicting it as sort of background story to some kind of personal struggle, right? So there's some, there are, I think, things that can be done along those lines, which for ordinary people is well within their grasp to make huge changes, perhaps. And can um, I take up a point there? Because um, in, in movies about invention, very often it, it comes out of nowhere. It, it's a, a light bulb. Whereas in fact, you know, um, it can become part of culture. Now, uh, Declan Asprey has, has asked us, you know, he says it can be taught, you know, how, how can we get it into the educational system that we're not dependent on random light bulbs suddenly going off in people's heads, which is how the movies often mm. portray it, but make it, you know, part of a systematic thing, teaching people how invention works and how they might turn their thoughts in that direction. And yeah, I, th I agree with that completely. Um, and I think, you know, that's actually a damaging depiction of invention, right? It makes invention seem that it's just some divine inspiration that you just have to be lucky enough that the idea comes to you. Or just as bad, perhaps, like think of Tony Stark in Iron Man or something. It's just his, his literal superpower is that he's a genius and, and a genius inventor. And so no one else can come close to that sort of thing, right? If you show, if children watching that just think, oh, I have to be a genius to be an inventor, that's extremely alienating. Whereas the reality of invention is that all sorts of different people have done it, right? Like the sample that I have has got Anglicans and dissenters, it's got women, it's got men, it's got pe poor people, rich people, people from the middle class, urban, rural, right? Invention, because it's a mentality, it can be adopted by pretty much anyone, the same way that anyone can get a disease or anyone can get a passion for stamp collecting, right? These are all things that can spread from person to person. They're kind of, they're, there's, there's actually nothing particular about people that, uh, you know, maybe their skill or, or the, their IQ or something will have an impact on their success as an inventor, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it'll change the, the fact that they will be an inventor. And I think that's the most important thing if we're trying to widen the very top end of the funnel so there's even more people coming down that pipeline. 
Um, what about, in terms of coming, uh, coming away from government and the education system for a moment, are the things that we can do to promote innovation through culture and civil society? Yes, I think that's, that's sort of the kind of thing that I think we should be looking at. Um, there are, I mean, one interesting model, for example, is young enterprise, right? This is a, a thing that lots and lots of school children every year go through where they set up a business um, and they try to make that business work and they sell a product. And so they're taught some entrepreneurial skills. And what's striking about that is that there isn't a version of that for invention, right? Very often the sorts of ideas they're coming up, are, they remind me of um, challenges on The Apprentice where you know, they're tasked with selling some nonsense to people who don't really need it. And it's really just about how good are they at getting people to buy such stuff. That's not quite the same as what I think really happens in the real world, which is noticing a problem and finding a solution or noticing a lack of, of something for someone and, and then trying to um, tap into that market, right? So I think you know, perhaps if you know, maybe we should have a young enterprise for inventors, again, something that anybody could set up um, and again, with things like film, with, with things like um, depictions in the media, I think those are especially valuable because the, the sort, I mean, I guess today it could be, what about YouTube channels? What about newsletters? What about all these other alternatives that we now have for spreading things via social media? How can we use those things to spread the improving mentality, get more people in contact with inventors in a way where they see what they're doing and they think, oh, I could do that too. I think that accessibility is absolutely crucial um, to its spread. Okay. Um, as I say, you've looked at 1,500 uh, inventors and presumably some of them did more than one invention. Um, so so you, you've got quite a good database there. Um, looking over it in, in the past, what do you think had the greatest, which invention had the greatest economic impact? Or perhaps made a greatest, the greatest difference to the world? It's a very tricky question. That's a very, very tricky question. Would you like extra time to think it over? <laughs> Perhaps. Um, I mean, it's easy when you, when looking at questions like that to, to focus on the big ones like steam engines and so on. Railways. Um, railways. Electricity, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a boring answer, I think, to, to come up with those, those sorts of things. My favorite inventors tend to be those who find very niche problems, but ones that are very important for specific people, for small groups of people. So I tend to say my favorite inventor is someone like George Smart, who comes up with a, a way of cleaning chimneys without needing to send small children up them. You know, mm. for, for the little boys, you know, of four up to 10, maybe a bit higher, who were getting cancers by the age, you know, horrible, horrible cancers by the age of 16, 17, 18, and then dying or dying in accident, accidents from that. You know, he made a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, he enabled the laws that would then be able to ban that thing because there was suddenly an a technological alternative to them. Um, I think, I mean, that's a kind of a way I like to think about invention is it's, it's worth us not actually not concentrating on, on, the, on the, the big successes like that because Again, that makes it inaccessible. The reality of invention, even of those big ones, is that they're really just incremental improvements, right? Even the improvements to the steam engine, if you look at Watt, or before that you look at Savory um, or, or Thomas Newcomen, if you actually look at the detail of what they were doing, you can actually split up their invention into lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of small marginal improvements. And they've just accumulated to the stage where it's, it appears once they unleash this thing or, or, or unveil it and kind of you know, take the veil off and show these things. Um, it appears as though um, it's some great brand new idea coming out of nowhere, when in reality, we need to break things down to the, margin, the marginal element of it. Okay, well, that was about uh, the inventions of the past. Now, if you um, <clears throat> put down your funnel and pick up your crystal ball uh, in its place, <laughs> and I ask you, um, what inventions now on the horizon do you think could have the biggest impact, either on the economy or on people's lives? So I'm talking about ones you can actually see at the narrow end of that funnel. That there are not, so there's, not... an interesting, there's an interesting thing happening, um, or that has been happening for the past few centuries, which is that every invention is becoming less and less impactful. And the reason for that is that as the economy grows and becomes more complex, the, purport, the, the relative impact, economically that is, so often GDP or overall statistics gets less and less. To give you an example, textiles. Textiles in Britain in the 18th century are a big, big deal. We're talking at least 17% of the economy. 
in terms of value added. So if you come up with a new way to improve weaving or spinning or something like that, um, you're having this huge impact. Now today, even in China, which now produces, you know, has taken over from Britain as the workshop of the world for things like textiles, um, you know, decades and decades ago. Even in China, we're talking no more than six, seven percent of the economy, right? So you would have to be three times as effective if you're the Chinese Hargreaves or Arkwright or Kay to have the same impact on the overall size of the economy because we've invented new, new industries. We've invented, we've grown the economy such and we've made it so complex and split it up into so many different bits that each particular invention becomes less and less valuable. Now, again, the thing here is that for the particular people who use that service or are interested in that particular industry, you've still got people coming up with huge leaps forward. Now, the, the interesting thing about this, however, is that conversely, there's one particular sector that's become more important, and that's energy, because everything uses energy, right? So in the 18th century, if you're coming up with um, improvements to the steam engine, you're actually having a, you're having a big impact, but it's a very long-term one. It's gonna get applied to the economy over a very long period of time. And it may not be that your particular improvement to the steam engine is the one that ends up being applied to stuff. Today, however, given electrification, given energy is now something where we all have a kind of, we all, we've figured out how it is that we're gonna transmit stuff into people's homes or into people's industries. Uh, we, we've figured out the consumption uh, side of things and made it effectively universal. If you come up with an improvement to the storage um, or the generation of, 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 of energy or of, of electricity, if you make that cheaper, you're going to have a larger impact relative to the economy um, than any improvements did before. And I think that's been happening over, over time. Um, the same even with general purpose technologies other than energy ones like internet, uh, inter, internet tele. Yeah, excuse me, telecommunications and so on, right? Which is that if you come up with this general purpose technology, you then need a whole bunch of other inventions to then apply it to each individual thing, right? So you invent the internet, now you need a separate invention to apply the internet to taxis and to ordering food and to, you know, whatever, or to dating or whatever other thing you, you want to use the internet for. With energy, you don't need that anymore because of the way that we've developed our, the system by which we consume it, by making it so universal. If you come up with an improvement to energy generation or storage, I think that's that's one of the biggest things that you can do as an individual inventor. Okay, um, Jacob Chapman has asked us about um, what essentially is, is networking. The, the fact that um, inventors innovators um, were part of a social network, and and they were at the, the in the age of invention, of course, things like the Lunar Society. You know, they, they interacted with each other. And we have the equivalent today in, in things like the Silicon Valley phenomenon. How important do you think this is, that this idea of being embedded in, in a, a kind of network of, shall we say, like-minded people? Hugely. I think, you know, if, you, if you're an inventor today, one of the most valuable things you can do is start meeting up with other, other inventors and not necessarily in your own field. Because yeah. um, if you have that kind of semi-formal or relatively formal institution, You've created an institution where if you bring a newcomer who's not that much of an inventor, you're, there's a, an increased likelihood that by simply being in the company of so many inventors, they're going to be inspired to the same thing. So it has that kind of exposure creating or, or increasing of virality there. Now, again, you know, England wasn't the only place to have all sorts of societies of inventors and researchers of, of that kind um, or com people coming up with improvements. But it was seems to have been especially good at creating them. Right? You have them all over the country. You know very rural places like, um, relatively rural places like Spalding in Lincolnshire and so on, um, or in, in, in the West Country, there's all sorts of different societies like this. The Lunar Society is a very famous one because of Watt and Bolton and Erasmus Darwin um, and so on. Um, but there are actually equivalents of it, sometimes older and many of them in, in the wake of it as well, all over the country. Um, and many of them that we haven't really heard of today, but were extremely important, I think, for those particular localities. Okay, um, we're coming into the last um, 10, 12 minutes. Um, a, a lot of the questions are asking about um, <clears throat> what factors within our control can we do to help and promote innovation, particularly as we're going to need a lot of it after the economy tries to recover on, from the pandemic. Um, let's talk about does regulation uh, have a significant impact? Does taxation play a role? I mean, would you say that there are things that can be done at that kind of macro level that will help? 
Sort of. I mean, again, I think these are very downstream policies. These are tweaking the incentives of people who've already decided to invent. Um, and this is borne out by a few studies, right, that show that it doesn't seem as though invention responds all that much, all that elastically to changes in taxation levels. Now, it could have a big impact further up the line in the sense that people might leave the country um, who are especially talented. And you, I think you see that with some countries all over the world where they essentially flee especially burdensome um, um, taxation or regulation um, regimes to go to places that are a bit, uh, a bit more lax. I think America has become a real Kind of place that sucks in a lot of people because it tends to have a lot of states where you can get a, you can escape from those sorts of things. Um, a lot of people like to incorporate in America. You know, Delaware is very famous for it. Um, in particular, a lot of people like to go to Silicon Valley because of the access to the network as well, which might be lacking a lot of, in, in in other countries. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a downstream thing, but overall it might have this effect. So the thing I'd be worried about when looking at things like regulations and taxation is the overall impression. Do people want to stay in the country to innovate there or do they want to leave? Um, that I think is much more important than the kind of tinkering with incentives at the end. Otherwise, to answer the first part of the question, um, yes, there's a lot that I think people can do today. I mean, be a prosthetizer for invention. Be an inventor yourself. As I say, it's something that I think is relatively easy for people to do. It's just about making improvements. Don't try to think about making money from it or, or the kind of end game for those improvements. Just make the improvements and see where those get you, because very often that's how um, a lot of invent inventors get their success down the line. Uh, yeah, we had a comment from David Brand who says, your arguments, Anton, are rather different from those Matt Ridley made in his um, Hayek Memorial Lecture 2018. Um, Matt seems to take the idea that, that ideas have sex with each other and it kind of happens by itself, almost as like Gaia, you know, <clears throat> you know, innovation is, is a kind of living entity that happens. I, I don't, I don't go along with that, you know, I, I think the people matter. And you know, I, I want your comment as, as to whether we should in fact be, be looking at the people who do the inventing and producing circumstances in which they're inspired to get up and go for it. Yeah. It's not so going to just happen, is it? Yeah. So I think the so the interesting bit of evidence that come that was always used, I think, in arguments like that, and I have I'm not familiar with that particular lecture, but that's often used is that you often find periods of simultaneous invention, that you end up with a particular year or, or set of year or very short space of time where it seems like a lot of different people invent the same thing pretty much at the same time. And then there's a sort of rush to the patent office or, you know, it's just, I think Darwin had a similar one for, for evolution. Um, or I think the telephone is one example. The screw propeller is another one where there's a whole bunch of claimants, about five or six even in, in, in Britain alone, um, who claim to pretty much around the same time invented the screw propeller. Um, now, that may be true, but I, again, I think the individuals are important. You need someone to actually be doing that invention, right? You need to actually have someone coming up with those ideas. Like the, the, the inventors, the, the ideas aren't having sex on their own. Um, so it might be that when we zoom out, it appears as though it's the system that's gradually just moving forward. Um, but that's a bit like zooming out and saying, you know, markets just happen, right? It's, 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 it's like the people, the actors involved are still extremely important and, and their incentives and the way that they work and whether or not they even engage in the market in a particular way is extremely important. Um, Let, let's look at uh, push and pull. Um, mm. Push is, um, is when you deliberately try to promote a culture of invention, try to make it easy for innovators, uh, try to spread, if you like, the whole climate that uh, people should be doing this. Um, uh, pull is when government just gets out of the way, <laughs> when, when, you know, it, it removes the regulations and burdens and the things that stop people going further down that funnel. Is it both? I think push is the most important. Yeah. So I think pull, it helps if it's there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think the story of the Industrial Revolution is actually pushing sometimes against the lack of a pull. Um, and actually kind of creating that space for invention to take place in the first place. Um, I think push is ultimately the thing that can always override any lack of pull or lack of demand factors there. Um, that, I think, is the story of the Industrial Revolution. Um, I mean, I, just bear in mind, you know, how little access to capital they had, how few people there were, how, how much less dense 
densely populate, populated the country was, how much less access to information people had, right? It's inventors themselves who are inventing encyclopedias and coming up with magazines to promote invention. Like they're the ones who are actively creating the conditions for that, that extra spread. So yeah, I think push is the most important thing for us to be looking at. Yes, um, we could push a little bit with the honours system, but as you say, we don't. We, we give the OBEs to inventors who've made money and given it to charity. Um, Steve Jobs famously said that he wasn't going to give billions to charity like his other, um, you know, oligarchs, rich people, because his contribution to humanity was through his work. Mm. It was through his, his, his inventions that he, he'd improve people's lives, not by giving money away. Would you go along with that? Yeah, I think that's that's. I mean, it's sort of nice when people do give their money away, but and that shouldn't necessarily be discouraged as such. Um, no, what what I meant was should we give it? Should we be giving them the OBEs? for the inventions yeah well i think there should be, I think there should be yeah i think there should be an alternative honor there should be a new order of chivalry specifically ah, for that name it um I, I would call it something like the order of athena or minerva yeah. right as the as the the goddess of, of of wisdom and usually the goddess of invention inventors along the way as well um, but that's just i mean protect one potential idea interestingly there were there were attempts to do something similar in the 1830s actually um, so the Royal Guelphic Order, which was one of the, the orders of chivalry from the House of Hanover. Before, Could you spell that? Pardon? Um, G-U-E-L-P-H-I-C. Oh, Guelphic, yes. Well, okay, got it. The Royal Guelphic Order was a Hanoverian one, so lost when Victoria came to the throne because of Salic law, um, which is when Hanover was split from, from, from the personal union with Britain. Um, but the Royal Guelphic Order in the 1830s was briefly used to reward inventors. So they get, tried to give it to Charles Babbage, who refused it because he thought it was a minor honour. He actually wanted a proper one. Um, they gave them to the Herschels, so the discoverer of Uranus, and then his son, who was also a major pioneer of photography and all sorts of other inventions, um, also an astronomer um, and mathematician. They gave it to a whole bunch of medical pioneers, uh, surgeons, as well as other scientists and inventors. And, and they kind of tried to use it as this alternative honour. Um, so there is some precedent for trying to do this, and I guess the big the big pity was that it got split off from the British Crown anyway, um, before it had a chance to get going and really set a precedent for being a new honour used for those ends. Mm. If we move towards um, summing up then, um, if we really want uh, the British economy to take off and pick up the slack, it's going to have to do new stuff, and so we should be looking at generating a climate in which people feel that they too can invent. We've got to make it easy for them. We've got to make it respectable and rewarding. And I don't mean financially, I mean in status. We've got to raise the status of uh, inventors and innovators. And we don't have all that much time to do it. Um, have you any specific proposals that can be done in the short term? I mean, education takes a long time to work mm. its way through. Is there anything more immediate? Yeah, so I think one way to do it is through something like the Great Exhibition of 1851. Um, now, I know there are proposals, there were proposals floating around for some kind of festival of Brexit or something or other, um, which I don't think is the way to go about it. Um, the problem with exhibitions is that people nowadays don't actually understand why it is that they were set up in the first place, right? So look at the opening of the Millennium Dome, for example, it was all sorts of random things and it wasn't really clear what was holding them together. In fact, even the same with the Festival of Britain in, in 1951, um, the, they actually lost sight of the way it was that the Great Exhibition functioned. And the reason for that is that the Great Exhibition was an engine of invention, right? It was the whole point was that people from all over the world would submit the best of what they produced, so the best machinery, the best products, and so on. Um, those would all be in the same space, the same room, side by side, so that if you were a manufacturer of textiles, let's say, you would go to the room full of all the textile machinery, and you would compare like with like, and you'd say, oh, I see, the, the Americans are a bit ahead of the Germans here, and they're a bit ahead of, ahead of us. And here's specifically what they're doing, and we can, what we can do to catch up. And the same on the product or consumption side, as consumers could look at the sort of things that were being produced in another part of the world and say, well, why don't we have that? Um, and so it becomes this engine of free trade. They say, well, okay, how come we're having to pay 30% more for this particular good that the French are getting for that much less or the Americans are getting for some other percentage less? Um, or why isn't this thing available at all to us? So 
the great exhibition as an industry of the uh, sorry an exhibition of the industry of all nations was had this very specific invention related and consumption related purpose it was about being an engine of improvement so i think if you're looking for short sharp shock type stuff that you could do to revitalize the economy something that tries to do that sort of thing right you're to write a paper you're to write a paper for the adam smith institute <laughs> a fairly short one proposing that we organize uh, an exhibition of inventiveness uh, at the end of the pandemic. This is also a Brexit thing. This, this is a pandemic thing. The world has been through a shock and we're going to show the world that Britain you know, is going to lead the way in coming out of it. And an exhibition- I've got one in the works actually already as a paper. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, can, can we publish it please? <laughs> Uh, yeah, to, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Um, we, we had um, someone point out, by the way, that, um, his name is um, uh, Malcolm. Uh, what's oh, sorry, uh, Michael Lambert. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm finding it difficult. Um, he, he says inventing is not all that difficult. Uh, product development is not all that difficult. Um, marketing. Now, sh should is there any way in which we can? we can get skilled marketers alongside inventors at an early stage, looking at their inventions and thinking, yes, well, if you tweak it here and there, we'd find that much easier to market and, and taking them through the essential stage of turning an idea into something that has an impact on the economy. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of improvement is about that kind of final stage is about finding a market for things. Now, it's not just about promotion or about finding an audience for things or advertising, I suppose. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of improvement that takes place, and especially in the British economy today, given the prevalence of services, um, you know, people forget that manufacturing is much more valuable in this country than it's ever been in any other time in history, pretty much. Um, it just employs far fewer people because we made it so damn efficient. Um, services are so important, so marketing is a big, a big part of, of, of that as well. Um, so coming up with improvements across the board is, is important. I mean, I don't think you can really focus on any particular thing. Um, improvement needs to be unleashed or continue to be unleashed or accelerated as much as possible um, in any and every um, avenue. As I said, you know, each invention is actually getting less and less impactful on the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. But that means you just need more people improving each and every bit. Yeah, we've got time for one more question. It's from Malcolm Wall, and he says... Um... What about the transnational element? Uh, the, these days, invention very often isn't country specific. You know, you, you move across several countries to do it. And um, several of the recent innovations have been like that. Is, is that something we, we should take into account? Yes, and I think, I mean, this is where international competition comes, comes in handy. I think there's value in trying to make, in having a kind of race to the top between countries, trying to be the most um, accessible and, and most, um, or the best place to be an inventor, um, because that just that results in better and better institutions that enable and unleash more innovation. Now, the thing is, you know, we we do it, we do benefit from inventions that take place abroad and, and are then applied in our economy as well. Um, and so, you know, it's not like we we should be trying to do down invention in other countries. It's a great thing that innovation having really accelerated in Britain in the 18th century and 19th century then starts to spread abroad. So the, the improving mentality becomes a kind of epi from an epidemic to a pandemic in some ways, in terms of how it starts to spread. And that's been a huge benefit to the whole world, right? Including us, right? Having lost the mantle of being, you know, the works of the world isn't, isn't, isn't so bad a thing at all, um, if it means that more people are out inventing us. But I think there is value in us also trying to out invent everyone else and everyone trying to do that at the same time, because the more invention there is, the faster growth will be, the faster living standards will rise, and the more, the, the better lives we will all experience. I love that phrase, race for the top. And that's a, a good note on which to, to end this. Um, Anton, thank you so much. That was uh, informative, interesting, enlightening, and absolutely packed with detail. I, I love this, and I hope our uh, listeners did. Thank you, may I say, to all our questioners, and thank you for the viewers who tuned into this. We hope to see you at the next Adam Smith webinar day, normally on Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye.